Greetings from First Missionary Baptist Church, Cave Springs, Arkansas. My name is Ernest Lostavica, and my prayer for you today is that you would be totally dissatisfied with the world around you, and that you would seek satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to be so dissatisfied that you would diligently seek the answers that you need in the Word of God, because there they are. There they are. We are to trust Jesus Christ with all things. Well, dissatisfaction with the world would be at the top of the list. Uh, Jesus said in John, the book of John, chapter 6 and verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Those are the words of provision of him being the total supplier of all our needs. Well, thus in our study today from Mark chapter 8, we will see, in fact, the, the whole lesson is entitled Bread That Satisfies. Well, we will start by reading chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. In those days, the multitude being very great, and have nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him, and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they now have been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, Well, how many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, and break them, gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus has so much to give, and he has given us his word, this word that has withstood the test of time for the thousands of years since it was all compiled, and from the 2,000 years when Jesus fulfilled the law, we have all the answers. And Lord God, we still question. and We still say, how can this be? Why is this so? Jesus Christ is always the answer. So, Lord, as we study today, help us to glean from it exactly what we need to know to understand what he has to say. And forgive us, Lord, our sin, because the sin is what keeps us from having true fellowship with our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name now we pray. Amen. Well, what do we have here? In the previous chapter, chapter 7, we saw Jesus teaching in Gentile territory, in the borders, coasts of Tyre and Sidon, and in the regions of Decapolis on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, all mostly Gentile-controlled territory. And he performed many, many miracles. So, as usual, multitudes of people came to see him and hear him. As we see in verse 1 of our reading today, it says, In those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them. Well, there's a crowd. 
and they had nothing to eat for three days. They're becoming weak from hunger. They're starving for something to eat. Yet, they're enduring it, fasting, in order to just hear the Master teach. And of course, he performed miracles too. But Jesus, in his compassion, he turns to his disciples and says, I cannot send them away. They're hungry. They're faint. They're weak from hunger. Some of them come a long way. They'll never make it home without hardship. They don't have the strength. And of course, this is a desert place. It's called the wilderness in our study. And he presents the problem to the disciples. He said, they, uh, the disciples said, where can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? Well, Jesus simply says, well, how many loaves of bread do you have? And they said, seven. Wow, the disciples had some bread. And he commanded the people then to sit on the ground. Before, as we studied in previous chapters, when he fed the 5,000, it was the Passover time of the year, and everything was green and grassy, and in that area where he was, it was a fertile plain, he told them to sit down on the grass. Now he's in the wilderness, it's in a later time of the year, the grass is brown and dead, and in this desert area, they simply had to sit on the bare ground. They don't seem to, the disciples had no answer for him. <sighs> There's no place to get food. That's absolutely true. It's a wilderness area. There's no food there. Well, have they forgotten that just a few months before, they had seen 5,000 men plus women fed with five loaves and two fishes? Could they forget so quickly that Jesus is in control? Well, the disciples had some of their own food. They probably weren't as hungry as these people there that were crowded around. Verse 6, Jesus commanded the people to sit on the ground, on the bare ground. Well, they sat on the ground, waited. And what did he do? He took the seven loaves, and he thanked God for them, breaks them, gives them to the disciples, and the disciples distribute the pieces to the multitude. Look at verse 7. They also had a few fishes. Not just two fishes, they had a few fishes. Well, Jesus blessed them and said, give them also. So in verse 8, they ate their fill. Can you imagine how hungry you would be if you had not eaten for three days? They probably had very little water, too, in this desert place. They ate their fill and had seven baskets left over. However many loaves he broke, that's how many baskets of leftovers he had. There are some similarities between the feeding of the 5,000 earlier um, and the feeding of the 4,000 here, if you compare the two, they have some meaningful differences. There are similarities and there's differences. If you are new in the family of God and you're reading the Bible and you happen to read this in Mark and you see this and you fed 4,000, which is miraculous, and then you read in Matthew about feeding the 5,000, you think, well, Mark is just leaving out a lot of the details and didn't get the numbers right. No, we're going to see that Matthew also talked about feeding the 4,000 at a later date, and Mark had just previously talked about feeding the 5,000. It was two different events, but there are similarities, but there are differences. The first difference is in Mark chapter 6, the 5,000 were fed after one day. Here we see they were hungry with that fasted three days. What a teacher God must be to take your mind off of food and sit and listen for 
for three days. The second thing, the first time, the 5,000, disciples went out looking for the food and they found the boy that had the five loaves and two fishes. But here we see the disciples already had the loaves and fishes. And the third thing we notice is that the first event, 5,000 men and five loaves and two fish, here less men, more food. 4,000, which was less populous, yet he had more bread and fish to work with. But it's still a small, small amount. The fourth thing, in the first event you had the green grass, now in this event you have bare ground. Well, the fifth thing we look at is the leftovers. Twelve baskets at the 5,000, seven baskets at the 4,000. Some who do not study the Bible carefully argue that the Bible contradicts itself and it presents it in events of different character. Well, it doesn't. It's recorded two times from memory, according to some people. They said, well, Mark and Matthew had to do this from memory. Matthew was there. He was a disciple. Mark heard about it from Peter. Peter was a disciple. So there were two different events recorded because God gave them the inspiration to record it that way. There, and well, in the verses to come, the last two verses we're going to look at today, Jesus plainly tells us in that last uh, part, which we'll study later, starting with um, well, 17 through 20, he says there's two events. So I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe Matthew, and I believe Mark. It is the word of God, it's set. So, looking at verses 9 through 12, Jesus sends them away filled, sends them away. And he and his disciples take ship, they're back on the Sea of Galilee, and they travel to a place called Dalmanutha, which was back in Jewish territory. And all right away, he's accosted by the Pharisees those holier-than-thou religious leaders who thought they knew the laws of God and that Jesus was an interloper come to take away the law, change the law, are just trying to make a name for himself as a prophet and was definitely leading people away from their religion. They said they were seeking a sign, seeking a sign of of him being God. You say you're from heaven, give us a sign to show that you are, prove that you're from heaven. And they tempted him. You do not tempt God. That's one of the rules of the Old Testament. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. You can't say, well, God's taking care of me. I believe God. I love God. He loves me. And if I do this, he's going to bless it. No, God has a a purpose for you in this world and you can't tempt him to change that purpose well look closely at verse 12 he sighed deeply in his spirit and said why does this generation seek after a sign verily I say unto you there shall be no sign given unto this generation he was done <laughs> with these Pharisees and their arguments and debates. Similar to what happened earlier at Nazareth, when he went to Nazareth to preach and teach the salvation and to preach the gospel and repentance. Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6 tells us he could there do no mighty work, and he marveled at their unbelief. He could not do any mighty works there because of their unbelief. And here in verse 13, he just left them. He left them and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. So we take up our reading now with him in the ship. Starting with verse 14, we will read through uh, 21. 
Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? That's a question that many of us ask all the time. Why is it like this, Lord? Why is this happening to me? How am I going to get through this next day? How am I going to get through this next year? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to pay my rent? How, how am I to survive? Jesus said, haven't you seen me work before in your life? Haven't you seen, haven't you heard my promises? Do you not know that I control all the riches of creation? And do you not know that I love you enough to provide for you no matter what, as long as you have faith in me? Well, he left. He left them, got in the ship. We see him now with the disciples. Verse 14, it says they'd forgot to take extra food for the journey. They had one loaf in the boat. What seems to be the biggest drive in the life of a human being is, what am I going to eat tomorrow? Or for that matter, every living thing on earth has to eat to survive. So when we see no food available, we immediately become concerned. The disciples were concerned. Jesus knew it. He saw it, but he began to teach them in a spiritual way. There are more important things in life than a full belly. That's what he wanted them to start looking at. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, how you're going to do all these things, because if you trust in him, he's already got it planned out, and he's going to take care of it. Verse 15, he says, listen to me. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Look out for the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. You see, there were many of the people being taught by the Pharisees. In fact, they had the whole teaching situation of Israel in their hands. They were strict legalists. Follow the law and you will be all right. Follow the law and you will be righteous before God. Follow the law and you may gain eternal life. But they fail, they fill the law with n national pride, patriotism, and I'm better than youism. They said, We are sons of Abraham. We are guaranteed many things by God. So the Gentiles were left out, and all those that hated the Jews were left out. So they had traditions also to appeal to the people, their ways, their sensual ways their natural ways, these traditions that religion is the way. So false teaching rose up. They began to worship the law as their God instead of the Creator. Then Jesus mentions the leaven of Herod. Had the leaven of the Pharisees, which would have been false teaching. Herod again was not a Jew. But a king, put in power by Rome, yet many of the people of Israel began to follow Herod. And they were called Herodians, a political group, only interested in keeping the Herod family on the throne in Israel. So what is this leaven that Jesus is talking about? Well, the Bible always uses leaven as an example of sin in our lives. The sin, especially of pride, which builds us up, fluffs us up, makes us think we're better than we are, makes us feel bigger than we are, 
and our looks are more important than our, the matters of the heart. That's what leaven does to bread. It takes this lump of dough that's absolutely nothing but flour and water, and without leaven, it has the same basic nutrients. In fact, if you looked at it closely, it has less nutrition in leavened bread than there is in unleavened bread. But here, blatantly represents sin in our lives. God's word uses the word leaven in our, uh, today we know that it is yeast that makes bread to rise. Also we have chemicals to make dough rise baking powder, baking soda, and from these we get delicious cakes, desserts, we get hot fluffy biscuits because of baking powder, but it's really still just flour, wheat flour, and water. And we do not like to eat unleavened bread. It tastes like dried wallpaper paste. Flour and water kneaded into a dough, flattened out, baked, but very tasteless. But let it be fermented with yeast, and it doubles in size, triples in size, becomes full of flavor, it smells good, tastes good, and it's appealing to look at. Basically, it's just flour and water, but what a difference. So what did Jesus mean to beware, to be careful, to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, verse 16, the disciples had no clue. They still didn't understand what he's talking about. They were just interested in bread, food. Well, they followed Jesus around. The multitudes followed Jesus around because they were looking for food to eat, handouts, and to watch miracles happen. So in verses 17 through 21, Jesus just unloads on these disciples and says, don't you remember how the 5,000 were fed from almost nothing? And how many baskets of fragments did you collect? And they said 12. And after the 4,000, how many? Seven. How is it that you do not understand? Well, John chapter 6 records the feeding of the 5,000. Then later, starting with Verses 25, John chapter 6, verses 25 forward. It says this. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him had God the Father sealed. Then he goes on and says, They said there unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? They said, Our fathers did not eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, now Jesus was giving bread from seemingly nowhere to eat, but zero in on something that they could see, they'd heard about in the 40 years in the wilderness that God fed his people. Then Jesus, in verse 32, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. And then they said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. They said, hey, start feeding us from now on. We'll follow you anywhere. Well, moving on, verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then he goes on, verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, 
Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Then he moves on to verse 47 through 51 in the sixth chapter of John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat therefore and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And to finish up, verse 58, This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus, like our title of the lesson stated, the bread that satisfies. If you're looking for satisfaction in life, it has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only provider of life. Yet the Pharisees taught against him. They tried their best to make him fail in some way. And of course, after they found out that he, they couldn't outwit him, they couldn't tempt him, they couldn't trick him, he always had the right words to speak. They finally, when he said, I am who I am, I am all these things, calling the name of God. And he said, the Father and I are one. They said, that's blasphemy. He's calling himself God. He is to be killed. Well, even today, we as believers have to be aware of this leaven which is introduced into the programs of church religion. The grains from which bread is made, the grains, corn, barley, rye, rice, and of course the best of the grains is wheat. In themselves, these grains can keep you alive. You eat solid grain, bread, and drink water, you will survive. But they became, if you eat that all the time, it becomes so mundane, so revolting. It's like the Israelites that became tired of manna in the wilderness. They said, we're sick of this, this white bread. Give us flesh to eat said, we need to go back to Egypt and eat all those beautiful vegetables, cucumbers, leeks, and you name it, they had it. They said, we had flesh to eat from the pots. Well, let's go back to Egypt. They were tired of the manna, even though it had everything they needed to sustain them for 40 years. But they got tired of it. So, what do we do? We start dressing up our bread with all kinds of additions to make them more palatable. The loaves, you make them taste good, and a little yeast goes a long way. Today, the simple truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, is being adjusted by liberal leaven to make it more palatable to be heard by the unsaved man in a church, to make religion taste good to the unsaved. Leaven, sin, whatever you want to call it, enters into the teaching of the Word of God. False teaching can fill up the pews of a church, but the lost will remain lost, filled with white bread. It looks good, tastes good, but totally deficient in nourishment. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Folks, we have to be we have to be aware of our leaders in society. If they're feeding us the untruth, that's the leaven of Herod. Do we really believe that Jesus is the bread of life? In his fashion, in what he's talking about, 
this everlasting life that he has promised us to gain that, yes, he has to become our bread. He has to become part of our life on a daily basis. We will live on him, feed on him, drink his living water, and he guarantees us everlasting life. And he promises to provide for us in any earthly situation. Yet Jesus is always more interested in our everlasting soul more than this mortal body. This mortal body is temporary, but his life is everlasting. And he gives that freely through faith. Through faith. He said, believe on me and you shall have everlasting life. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. If you want any type of conclusion, when he said here, why reason ye because ye have no bread? We have to look back at what Jesus has done for us in our life. If you're saved today, you have a place that you can look back to where Jesus did a miracle. He saved your life into everlasting life. If you haven't found that, then you can be like the disciples that said, what are you talking about? Jesus says, repent, turn from your sins. Repent and ask forgiveness, and I will truly give you the bread of life and a living water to drink from that's everlasting. Salvation is that simple. It's to give Jesus Christ his proper place, to know that he's Lord, know that we're sinners incapable, and then turn it over to him and ask forgiveness. And he promises us, to come and live for us, through us, and with us. And then, after the resurrection, to live in eternity forever and ever. What a deal that he gives us. And he says, I am that bread of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all the things that you do for us on a daily basis. And as we come into trials and and difficulties and situations beyond our control. Help us just look up and say, Lord, I trust you because I'm yours and you love me. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.